I first need to though disclose that I didn't assign this this title, and and so I'm going to have to say I failed in this, Jens. There are no meaningful interventions, <laughs> but I'm going to I'm going to try and come as close to that as possible. As far as disclosures, none except that there's going to you're going to hear a lot of personal opinion, and and not much evidence. So please keep that tongue in cheek. Um, <clears throat> Let's start with a case, 79-year-old healthy active cyclist, uh, actually a mathematician professor at the University of Arizona, ran into a stationary vehicle, unable to move his extremities at the scene, alert oriented on exam, C5 quad with anti-gravity biceps, Asia A. And this is his CT scan, uh, his T2 sagittal, mid-sagittal mid and stir images. And so I, I'm sure lots of people uh, have in this room have been faced with treating this kind of a person. And my particular management in this was non-operative. Uh, I saw him at six months. He had improved biceps and some triceps coming back and Asia A. Uh, and his, his MRI scan showed, as you might imagine, that the cord swelling had decreased and there was no active compression at that time. Now, you might ask, well, why didn't you treat him operatively? And um, the, the reason for me was his age and his overall um, condition. And I, I just want to ask the audience, how, what percentage of people with spinal cord, cervical cord, Asia A, get intubated? Most of them, yeah, over two-thirds. And that's usually within the first 24 hours. And what's the common cause, most common cause of death in people with Asia A, spinal cord injuries? Pneumonia. And that's usually within the first six months. And in some series, depends on who you read, but that's as high as 20 to 40%. So rather than treat his Asia A spinal cord injury, I was certain that if I put him through an operation, he was not coming off that ventilator, and he was going to have a high odds of dying because of his age. Uh, so my goal, rather than treat his spinal cord injury, was to keep him alive. And he, he flew through his rehab without ever getting intubated. Uh, and, and the trauma surgeon actually thought that I was crazy for doing that. He wanted to trach him right away. So I, I think this sets the stage. There's controversy. Um, the background is that it was first described in 1954 by uh, a a pathologist called Schneider, and the hypothesis was that the buckling of the ligamentum flavum caused by a hyperextension injury in a narrow canal caused additional narrowing, and I think that's pretty well maintained today. And the idea then was that um, this would cause uh, injury to the medial corticospinal tract, which in many um, in many pathology and anatomical uh, publications is, is thought to be laminated, and I'm going to come back to that in a minute. <clears throat> but Schneider, when he first described this, postulated it was a non-surgical disease because uh, many patients spontaneously improve. It's a fragile cervical cord, and uh, often neurologic findings can be mild, although I'd have to tell you in Arizona that's not always the case in our aging population. So as we've heard, the guidelines have tried to address this, and the, there were 2,028 citations that had to do with central cord, but only 29 of them in the published literature had to do with management outcomes, and all of them are class three retrospective data. So when you try and synthesize this, the best that we could come up with on the guidelines committee was that intensive care unit management uh, with acute central cord syndrome is recommended particularly patients with severe deficits, and medical management, including cardiac, hemodynamic, respiratory monitoring, and maintaining the MAPS for the first week after injury. That's the best evidence we have out there, and even that is, is retrospective evidence. There's nothing mentioned here about timing, because there's actually nothing in the literature when it comes to timing for central cord injury. Um, so we we sorry we we defaulted back that it should be decompressed, but we left the timing aspect out of it alone. There's been um, a study that was in that that we came across that was interesting to me, published in 1971, 42 patients, long-term follow-up, a universal trend towards improvement. But Bosch 
represented back in the, uh, published in the 70s, 24% long-term deterioration. And it seems strange to me because I don't recall the, seeing that in my practice. Well, this was, this was the way they looked at it. Um, set 33% um, amb ambulation at admission, 77% ambulating discharge, and dropping to 59% on their follow-up. Similarly, uh, hand function improved, and we didn't have an intermittent but it, on, on bladder and bowel, but it was this ambulation picture that, that they alerted to. And then what do you know, here comes uh, Mr. JT, or Ms. JT, sorry, 71-year-old retired nurse, motor vehicle accident in Jul July 2017. She had an L1 burst, but was neurologically intact, except for bilateral hand burning and tingling, which at the ER time that she was admitted to my service was improving daily. She had a whole spine MRI, and when, when I examined her, she had mildly diminished light touch in her fingers, but her dexterity was normal, and she was otherwise normal as well. So we treated this conservatively in a, in a, in a TLSO. And this was her whole spine, cervical spine, which really doesn't, it's, it's poor quality MRI, and, and I apologize for that, but the axials show that she does have a, a tight canal. Well, I saw her at six months for routine follow-up. Some mild numbness in her fingers had persisted. Her dexterity was still normal. We were gonna keep an eye on this, but at nine months, she came back having had two months of right leg and foot weakness, difficulty with balance, dropping a fork, spoon, trouble with buttons and shoelaces. And on exam, fluid spas fluid spasticity in both arms and legs, clonus, Hoffman's reflexes, claw hand. And this is a patient who was nearly neurologically normal just a couple months ago. And here's her MRI. You can see how it's changed. And on the axial sequences, the signal change inside the spinal cord is uh, is impressive. So here I can attest to the fact that this is a non-operative patient, non-operative of my hands, after nine months neurologic deterioration. So it happens, it's something to be aware about, and it's changed a bit the way I think about this. Well, if we look at other guidelines papers to try and help us, there really is only one other guidelines paper published recently by AO Spine uh, to do with central cord syndrome. And they looked at a systematic review and came up with um, five studies by uh, failings and failings and failings and failings. And one study by um, Rahimi Mogavar, uh, it, and it wasn't published in a peer-reviewed journal, it was just a paper presented at Riyadh Neurosciences in 2014. The problem with most of these were that all, uh, that all of them except two had to deal with spinal cord injury, not central cord um, syndrome specifically. But nonetheless, the authors felt that they could suggest early surgery, 24 hours after injury, should be considered as a treatment option in adult patients with traumatic central cord syndrome, quality of evidence low, strength of recommendation weak. I don't have any personal problem with this. I think, I think it certainly should be considered as a treatment option for sure. This is another patient of mine, a 76-year-old retired engineer who was referred to me because of low back and leg pain, at neurogenic claudication. At age 54, so over 20 years ago, he went head over heels over handlebars. Initial quadriplegia, able to move within hours, long-lasting hand and arm weakness and paresthesias, which lasted months, but he made a full recovery. And on my exam, all he had was two beats of unsustained clonus at each ankle. Here is his MRI in 2000. And six. Here he is later, uh, over 10 years later in 2018. And so here is axial views. This is a non operative patient 22 years later after his quadruporetic episode, central cord, who's neurologically normal. So where I'm going with this is not only is the literature all over the place, the cases are all over the place, even in my experience. I don't have any anecdotes that I can say, this is what I've learned, because I really don't know what I've learned. But what I can say is that if I, th I think where we can start with this is trying to drill down into a little more detailed understanding of how central cord might be different from regular spinal cord injury. So I mentioned to you, Forster pr proposed that the spinal cord corticospinal tracts seen here are laminated and that cervical and thoracic and lumbar and sacral works its way out from this medial to lateral. 
And I, I'm, I'm going to say, I'm, one, I'm going to wonder if anybody wants to stick their neck out and tell me what the corticospinal tract does in people. I'm glad we have silence. Nobody, that means nobody is absolutely passionate about sticking their neck out. So um, actually, as it turns out, with modern retrograde axonal tracing techniques, there's no evidence at all of lamination in the corticospinal tract. And so Forrester was wrong, and our current concept of central cord injury primarily taking out the hands because we're affecting the medial part of the corticospinal tract is not probably correct either. Indeed, there have been a number of authors that have actually cut the corticospinal tract in primates. And do you know what the primates can't do? How many of you think they can't walk? Hands up. Oh, we got some tentative, but most people are staying clout couched. Well, if you cut the corticospinal tract in primates, as it turns out, they can walk, they can run, they can swing, uh, but what they can't do is use fine finger movements. And so what we know really based on anatomical um, studies is not so much of a question, but the, the corticospinal tracts are uh, control fine finger movements. And if you get your next central cord patient to try wiggling their fingers dexterously and they can't, get them to try wiggling their toes and see what they can do with their toes. And that's part of the corticospinal tract as well. So how do we think of this? Well, think of a, think of a, 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 a handful of spaghetti. And let's, let's just think for a minute. When you squash that spaghetti, this is uncooked spaghetti, when you squash it, it just kind of molds into a flattened shape. And those, those descending fibers just, just kind of take on a new conformation. And we see that in, in people that have cervical spondylosis and are neurologically normal. But if you think for a moment and add a cross-sectional reticular network into that, then when you compress it, that reticular network gets stretched. And in, in some points, if you stretch it enough, if you compress it enough, it's, it's going to break, even though the, the vertically oriented um, fibers, if you will, remain intact. So if we think the corticospinal tract is not laminated, but controls fine finger movements and fine toe movements, and you have your spaghetti running up and down the spinal cord here, then add into this, uh, anybody recognize this? This is a colloidal carbon angiogram through the cervical spinal cord in a rat, in a rodent. And what this shows is that the blood supply to the spinal cord comes in through the anterior spinal artery, and then it, it radiates radially through the gray matter, and then finally into the white matter. But this is that cross-sectional reticular pattern that I'm talking to you about. The axons are oriented vertically, the blood vessels. And so when you compress it and then let it go, guess what happens? The blood vessels stretch and shear, and you get a hematoma, and recall that the corticospinal tract is right here, and your ability to walk and, and to stand is controlled by reticulospinal and vestibulospinal here. So I think this provides some insight into what corticospinal um, central cord syndrome really can be all about. It's a gray matter injury, and it's also a corticospinal tract matter injury, but the other pathways, not so much, variable. You can still have Asia A, but you can have everything in between. So the learning points, I think, are that central cord syndrome is a post-traumatic acute neurologic deficit and it is localized to the cervical spine. It's without fracture or dislocation. I really think we need to clean up that def this definition. A lot of people have put fracture dislocations in with central cord. I think we need to tighten it up and just say central cord means no fracture or dislocation usually almost always pre-existing spondylosis or at least a congenitally tight canal that takes it out of the realm of skiwara. It potentially affects the hands more than any other part because of the corticospinal tract, and it's an inside-out injury because of the traction and shearing of the vessels versus compressive pathology, which is in outside in. And this may be important in trying to figure out why this pattern behaves differently than regular spinal cord injury. So what's really at stake with the treatment here? Why are we talking about a different treatment? Because there is no acute spinal cord compression, unlike fracture dislocations where there is acute spinal cord compression. Is it hematomyelia? Is it a compartment syndrome? We need to do that work. And I think that we have inconclusive evidence. And when we have inconclusive evidence, guidelines need to reflect opinions of thought leaders, 
but they need to accommodate current practice. So here's my algorithm. If you've got, this is the Hurlburt guideline, it's because I say so, all right, not because of anything else. If you've got neurologic deterioration, then that patient needs emergent decompression. If you've got a neurologically stable or improving patient, then you can do urgent or you can do elective. And that would be my recommendation for guidelines. I think there's an opportunity. We're starting a multi-centive prospective observational study. We hope to get better answers on this. And um, thank you for that. That's why.